Good morning, church. My name is Edward Miller. I'm one of the elders here at Faith Community Church. I want to welcome each one of you this morning. We are uh, here gathered on uh, the post-Thanksgiving Sunday. So uh, well done for those of you who could still fit your belt on this morning. I hope everybody had uh, a good opportunity to spend time with friends and family and uh, hope that we are in a mindset of uh, being thankful the many things we have to be thankful for. Kevin's away today, and I have the uh, good fortune and opportunity, privilege to speak today. Uh, we expect to see Kevin back next week. Uh, this morning we're going to be, uh, as Steve said in Psalm 107, where the psalmist states, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. We're going to focus today on struggling and the promises of the Lord as we go through life and deal with our struggles. Uh, I'd like to ask us if we could take a, t- take a moment, bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, creator of the universe, we come to you today grateful for your love and mercy. We thank you for the opportunity to come together and worship you as the body of believers. May your word go out in this place today in a clear and meaningful way. I pray that no one would get in the word of, way of your word today. And we pray for the hearts of those that you've been preparing for this time. As ask that your spirit would lead us this morning. We ask this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me, if you would, to Psalm 107, where we start in verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the trouble and gathered from the lands from the east and the west. So you might ask the question, why do we have to deal with these struggles? Why why do we have these challenges? Well, here's the reality of why we need redemption. Number one, we have an adversary in the devil who is working against us with everything he's got for us to take our eye off God Almighty. We are sharing uh, this world uh, with those saved and unsaved that are sinners as well. And we're dealing with the sin out there in this depraved world. And we have our own flesh getting in the way of uh, what God would have us do. Thankfully, we have uh, victory in Christ. Uh, who overcomes all these things, and we have an opportunity to participate in that in him through his grace. Uh, There are several important themes that are repeated through scripture, and we're going to focus on one today where we find God's people suffering. Some due to a calamity they brought upon themselves and others that are simply the victim of the assaults and the insults of a depraved world. We see time and again God's people come to him with a humble heart, cry out, Cry out for mercy, for deliverance, and for redemption. And we see time and again God answer those prayers and bring his people to another place. Psalm 107 speaks of several groups experiencing suffering. We see a people who found themselves wandering in a wasteland, a people in darkness who are near the shadow of death, prisoners of affliction, as well as a group going down, in, down to the sea in ships with the intent to do some business that takes a mighty turn for the worse. In each of these uh, instances, those being discussed are struggling mightily. And today I'd like to consider suffering in light of God's redemption and him bringing us to a better place. So before we dig in, I want to clarify what I'm not saying. It's always interesting to me when, when what is said or what is inter- intended is not always what is heard. Stephen Covey writes in his book, The Speed of Trust, that when there's good understanding between two people, one person can say something poorly and the other one knows exactly what they're talking about. And maybe you've experienced that as well. And where there's not good understanding, there's not good rapport, someone may say something with precision and yet the other party still doesn't see where they're coming from. It happens a lot if you ever get any discussions about politics when one person will state a fact and the other person, instead of responding, that will state a different fact and people just keep talking past each other. That's not what I want to do this morning. Secondly, I've got a concern because of an experience I've had with Siri. I don't think Siri likes Southern people. (laughs) I will press that little button, the microphone, and I'll say what I need to say or what I intend to say, and then I'll read what she thinks she has heard. (laughs) Siri, I don't use some of those words, and if I did, I wouldn't put it in a text to my mother. (laughs) You're not being helpful. You're going to get me in trouble. Please hear my heart. I'm not here trying to belittle anybody's suffering. I'm not trying to imply that there's any quick and easy fix, that you just say a couple magic words and all this goes away or you're not trying hard enough. 
Sometimes these things take a long season. There are some that will be called home before they completely get out of the darkness that they are living in. That is a struggle and a reality. I pray we're all called home soon enough. But what I want to ask us today is to consider that God cares about us in our struggles and wants something specific from us. So I'm not holding my own struggles up against yours or or others that I've witnessed to compare or, or to try and compete with here. That's not it at all. I know that there's, uh, it'd be foolish to act like there's always just some simple little fix. I know that the deeper and more complex your challenge is, the more difficult and timely to address uh, the issue it may take. But this I do know. We are typically in at least one of two groups, sometimes in both. We're either going through a trial or a struggle or somebody close to us is. And again, I say, God Almighty, the creator of the universe, knows where you're at. And he cares how you respond to your struggles. He wants us to take his challenges to him. So in your sermon notes, if you, if you look, uh, Roman numeral one, God wants us to take our concerns to him. Please consider in verse four, we see some wandered in the desert wasteland. This certainly could be God's chosen people led by Moses out of Egypt. This also could apply to anyone who feels as though they are just existing through life, no clear plans on where they're going, feeling alone, and in verse 5, hungry and thirsty, their souls fainted within them. That may be the uh, description of how some are feeling here today. You know, it's not unusual for a member of our society to look out and see so much excess and begin to feel disconnected. If you don't feel like you don't have enough or you don't know where you're going, Even though we as a culture have plenty to eat, we're well clothed, and most are well sheltered, we as a society continue to want, and many live lives of lonely desolation, isolation. Instead of looking to one another for friendship and sources of encouragement, we often seem to be trying to one-up each other in what we can possess. We have devices that allow us to browse things as we uh, go to sleep at night. And if we want to, we can wake up the next morning and go right back. And we don't even have to get out of bed to order some of this stuff we want. And frankly, we don't even need the money to pay for it. If we've got a credit card, we can, we can believe the lie that we need this thing. It's going to improve our lives. And, and getting it immediately is important. And paying for it is something we'll worry about later. That's a norm in our country. Or maybe we're looking at our preferred social media site. And, and we look out and we see our friends and we believe the lie that everybody else is living life like it's some sort of TV commercial. Beautiful people with no problems just having a great time. While you and your life feel overwhelmed and struggle and wonder, how am I going to do all this? Here's a public service announcement. Facebook can be misleading. I, I, I do have a beautiful family. I like to go pretty places and take pictures of them. So I'm not telling any lies when I put up uh, stuff on Facebook. But if you get the idea that that's my entire life, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be disingenuous, but that's not the case. I too have my fears. I have my challenges. I've got close friends that know the nitty gritty challenges in my life and the things that I battle with. And I trust them with that. But more importantly, I lay that before the throne of almighty God. And that's what makes all the difference. I would ask that we keep that in mind when when the lie creeps into our heart as we look at it. They've done studies. People that look at Facebook a whole lot often increase in their depression. We're getting the wrong story there much of the time. If you would, please look at verse 6. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. This verse is repeated at a, a similar interval three more times in the chapter. God knows our suffering. And he wants us to take our concerns to him. How do we take our concerns to God? He wants us to pray. He wants us to pray early and often. Paul tells us in Thessalonians chapter 5 to pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. And get this. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So if you're wondering what the will for God in you that Christ Jesus had. Is that we would pray without ceasing. As I understand it in the original language, 
uh, they're not talking about just, just constant in the, in the way we would think our, our heartbeat is constant. or It's more like a nagging cough, which if, you're not, if you don't have already, it's probably coming in January, February, right? <laughs> we get the, everybody shows up at the gym and passes around in January, and everybody leaves and goes out in the world and passes that around. But it, we still get a chance to sleep, and we still get a chance to eat and to pause and pay our bills, but it, it never really goes away, right? It just kind of keeps coming back and keeps coming back. That's the way our prayer life is to be. As we find ourselves uh, navigating our lives, we're, we're to be considering a complete and holy God in all we're doing. And if we are more mindful of what's going on in relation to him, our problems tend to get a little bit smaller and, and the lies get a little bit easier to, to dispel as we're contemplating where these things line up before a complete and holy God. While in the vein of prayer, I would ask you to consider the Lord's Prayer and ask you this. Do we pray the Lord's Prayer or do we just say it? In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 6, Jesus does not say, memorize and say in unison the following. Although it's a beautiful thing when we do it as a church. God, Jesus says, in this manner pray. And then take a look at what he does. The very first thing he does is not say, here's what I want, God, give it to me and make this stop. No, the first thing he does is he acknowledges God Almighty. He acknowledges where he sits and he praises his very name. Next, he asks that there would be an end to this age, that his kingdom would come. And if not that, that perhaps we here on earth would be obedient to God like they are in heaven. That's his plea, that's his request, that's Jesus' priority. So before he gets to the request for his daily bread, something God, know he, God knows he needs, and most of us, most Americans kind of take for granted that's coming. He has put God's will first and it recognized God's glory first. And I ask us each one to consider that as we, as we prepare to go to God and consider laying our thoughts before him, that he's not a three wish genie. He's the creator of the universe. And just because he allows a relationship between us and cares about our problems and knows the numbers of hairs on our head, we still need to remember who he is and how we approach him. We can, see, uh, we can see Jesus' priority on who God is when he prays. Then at the end, and we don't usually recite this, in verses 14 and 15 after he says the Lord's Prayer, Jesus clarifies that we will be forgiven. He acknowledges that we will be forgiven in a similar manner, or not, to the way we forgive others. And I wonder how often we contemplate that as we look out of the world and we hold on to some of our struggles and frustrations with others. That we've been, been forgiven of so very much, we need to be mindful of how we hold on to that which others have done to us. So we take uh, our concerns to him. There's another common theme in scripture that we need to consider as we approach our creator of the universe. God hates pride and God lifts up the humble. So items A and B under Roman numeral one in your sermon notes, God recognizes pride and God recognizes humility. So you may be able to fool me or fool your friends or, or I may be able to fool you, but God knows exactly the condition of my heart. And you might say, well, look, I don't have a problem with pride. Some people know they do. And, and maybe you don't have a problem with pride. But I'd ask you as an American to consider this. In this culture, we know our rights. We know that when we go to the store, the customer is always right. You know, just about any dispute uh, that we have uh, in this day and age, a lawsuit is a real consideration. Whether you're right or wrong, there are many attorneys out there, and I'm not knocking attorneys. There's good ones and bad ones, just like plumbers and chiropractors, right? There's many that are out there, so, well, you know, you may not be right, but I still think we've got a case so we can get something out of this, okay? That's not how we approach God Almighty. Check yourself when it comes to pride. I've got a, a child now working in the brand new Outback, and uh, when there's a long wait for an hour wait, it's amazing the number of people that will yell at my child as if she somehow is causing these people to sit here and enjoy their meal longer than they, they wanted to. I'd love to have conversations with those people, but uh, <laughs> set them straight. But we've, we've got to be mindful of, uh, particularly in our society, where we know our, our voice matters to a certain degree, we do not want to approach God in that manner. You know, if humility doesn't resonate within you on any level, you really may not understand what it means 
to have God's grace in your life. What scripture means when it says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sins. You know, this, these, all of these messages of redemption here in Psalm 107 really point to the ultimate story of redemption. That each one of us, I, I pray if it's a new story for you, as I run through this, if it doesn't stick, please come get me. I want to talk about it again. But the ultimate story of redemption is that before or while we were yet sinners, while we were still uh, at our best, like filthy rags before a complete and holy God, Jesus Christ was willing to live a perfect life to take on um, all of our sin and to take on a punishment that he in no way deserved. Talk about unfair. Most unfair thing of all time, right? Jesus took on our sin that if we would put our faith in him, that he is who he said he was, the son of God, the perfect lamb of God, that what he did was a perfect sacrifice for our sin. We put our faith in him through his gift of grace that we may have eternal salvation, not of any work that we have done. This story of redemption, of God taking us to another place, is ultimately told when we get to spend our eternity in heaven if we've placed our faith in him. In the meantime, while we're still here on this side of eternity, Jesus has promised that his Holy Spirit will be with us as a helper to navigate these challenges of life. I would ask you to look at verse 10. Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners of affliction, for they rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. In verse 17, some were fools, and grew, uh, some were fools with their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities, they loathed any kind of food and grew near the gates of death. We have to be careful of what we prioritize. We need to consider what we're longing for. Are we desperate for the acceptance of others so much that we sacrifice our well-being? Imagine how our actions might be different if instead of worrying about what people thought the people were trying to impress, instead we considered our time, our effort, and our energy towards what was important to God. We are living in a time where body image is driving people of all ages but particularly younger people who live unhealthy lives in large numbers, and it is heartbreaking. In a similar fashion, our society and others, not just ours, this happens other places around the world, people are experiencing debilitating struggle where they can't describe exactly what is wrong. They just know they don't feel good. We as a society have so many places to turn to try and change the way we feel. We've got our phones with instant access to just, uh, just seemingly unlimited amounts of entertainment and games. We can, we can get cheap and easy access to food. It's typically not good for us, but it's tasty, right? That can change the way we feel. Some people turn to alcohol or drugs, uh, be it legal or illegal, to, to change the way they feel, to numb themselves to the challenge of life. And the challenge with that, particularly as easy and quick as it is, we may fail to actually even take a moment to assess what's even really wrong. I think it takes a certain amount of maturity to go to God in a humble way and ask him to reveal, God, what am I doing wrong that you want me to change? Please reveal to me that which I'm blind to or that which I'm aware of, but I keep acting like I'm entitled to keep acting that way. I, I can't stand up here and tell each one of you what you need to do, but he can. I don't, want it, I don't want that job, by the way. I'll be your friend. I'll talk to you. I'll be honest. I'll let you know if there's something in your teeth. I, I, I'm that kind of guy. But <laughs> to ask God Almighty to reveal those things to you and then to trust him that he's not going to leave you where you are. My father has an old saying. It says, he says, trouble never, never leaves you where it finds you. Depending on how you react to it, you're going to end up in a better spot or a worse one. And we don't always look at our troubles that way, right? Oftentimes, we just complain about them. We lament about them. We get together with our friends that like to complain too, and we just commiserate. Very little healing, very little beneficial comes out of that. So we pray to God, and in Roman numeral two, pay attention to his response. I can't tell you how often the scripture I read from day to day speaks right to my heart, right where I'm at. 
I've been to a number of sermons where I felt bad for everybody else that showed up because it was obviously tailor-made for me. And I, I hate that everybody else might have wasted the morning, right? I've seen very specific. I've seen in the last couple of weeks, God placed something on my heart that challenged me with a friend. And I, I have struggled with the thought of presenting that to that friend and, and prayed about it earnestly, knowing I needed to do something, have that friend come to me and bring the subject up because God was working on them as well. So I've seen very specific prayer in my life and in the lives of others. I was in a church years ago before we attended here. I'll never forget it. We were sitting in an adult Sunday school class, and I was one of the younger guys in there. And there's a guy that was out of work, but he was an actual rocket scientist. So a really smart guy. He believed in God. But as we were sharing our prayer requests, he said this in frustration. He said, you know, there's a God, but he's, he's worrying about the cosmos and the sun rising and all the, everything else going on and keeping the world spinning. He's not worried about your little details. And it floored me. And I paused, and nobody said a word. And without thinking, I said, look, you're wrong for three reasons. Number one, Jesus told us to pray. Jesus was serious about prayer. He didn't just do it in a moment. Jesus prayed, he told us to pray. And man, he was going up against some difficult things. Number two, people that I know and trust have told me about God answering prayers in their lives. Not, not some movie, not some story, but family. My grandfather, who passed away recently, and I had the great privilege to speak at his funeral, we spoke about him being a praying man, day in and day out. And the place that he started and where he ended up did not happen just by his hard work or his good attitude. Very hard worker, very smart man. But he didn't leave a uh, middle school education and get to the point where he retired a very wealthy man, but not defined by his riches, defined by his love for the Lord and his trust in him. And he would describe God carrying him all along the way. Third reason I told that man I believed he was wrong is God's answered prayers in my life. I've never heard his audible voice, but I've seen his fingerprints on my life and my friends and in my family. I've seen prayers answered when I've seen my children struggle and I've seen him answer those prayers and bring them to a new place. I know that God's an God answers prayers. And then I paused and nobody else said anything and it still kind of shook me. We did not attend that church much longer after that. <laughs> so pay attention under Roman numeral two, uh, the next one down, pay attention to who he puts in your life. You know, as the new year comes, there's going to be a, a push. I believe the elders are talking seriously about trying to figure out a way that we can better connect here at Faith Community Church. This, this has always been a good place to come and serve. But I pray we can be more intentional. And I would ask the congregation, let's be more intentional about figuring out how we can get together and we can encourage one another. Not everybody here, by the way, if you're dealing with something really challenging, you need a wise counselor. I know, I know he can't be everywhere at all times. I'm mighty thankful for the ministry of Pastor Jim Johnson, who uh, I have brought friends to and I have gone to at difficult times. And uh, I know there's others as well. But sometimes we just need to be a friend that points to God, encourages and encourages our friends as we are struggling through life. Pay attention to who God puts in your life. And if you find yourself dealing with someone that is struggling, be prayerful about what you do. Be careful about what you say. And, and be loving. Also, uh, while paying attention to who comes into your life, be weary of those that point away from God. Be weary of those things that want to grab our attention and numb us in the moment or distract us. And I'm not saying that it's bad to go to the movies. I'm not saying that it's bad for entertainment or, or finding a moment of rest. But if that's all we're living for, then we're not really living. Roman numeral three, prepare for what could be a long season. Know that if you want to go at it alone, it could be even longer. It was 17 years uh, for Joseph from the time he was sold into slavery by his brothers and worked as a slave in Potiphar's house. And in no less than two years that he spent in prison, we, we know it was probably longer than that, but at least two years, the Bible says, because it was two years from the time that he uh, reminded uh, the king's servant to remember him uh, after he'd interpreted the dreams. And yet after that two year period of time, uh, Joseph was restored and ultimately made the overseer of Egypt. 
Abraham and Sarah waited 25 years before God fulfilled uh, his promise in their heir in Isaac. And we know in that 25-year period of time, at some point in time, the two of them uh, took matters into their own hands. And uh, Abraham and uh, Hagar had Ishmael. Uh, I get the sense she said it was fine. And uh, he took that the wrong way. It wasn't fine. It was the wrong thing to do. And we're still suffering from uh, that decision today as we see challenge come from that unintended union and people taking uh, the matter into their own heart, hand instead of trusting God in those circumstances. So if you are in a long season, I would ask you, what do you think God wants us to do while we wait? Do you think maybe he wants to prepare us for the next phase before we just rush to it? What if he wants to produce a greater faith in us like James speaks of? Today, in light of a trial you may be experiencing or suffering, I realize it may be more complicated than one, than one simple linchpin that you can pull loose and head in a new direction. For you, the best that maybe can happen today is that you can ask God to begin the healing, that today would be a new day for you, and that you would grow closer to him, trusting him more, and bring you to a new place. For some, there is an obvious place to start. As Jesus spoke about forgiving others after he said the Lord's Prayer, I would ask, are you holding on to a hurt brought on to you by another believer? Is there unresolved sin between you and another that needs to be addressed? You know, when I first came to Faith Community Church, I remember my wife and I sitting in the newcomers class. And one thing that I just found to be almost profound, I remember Pastor Ed saying, hey, if you left another church because of a conflict there, we may want to talk to you and see if we can go back and work on that. And that floored me. Because who wants to do that? I mean, you talk about sticky and, and real and no fun. You know, it's separated. Let's not dig that wound back up. That was not an effort, I don't believe, to get in other people's business or go correct people. But for healing and unity within the church, that told me something about what this place was about in an effort for being biblical and mature. So if there's in unsolved sin between you and another that needs to be addressed, we need to be careful not to hold on to those things so tight that we forget how to let go. We forget how to let go. That's why Siri can't understand me. I mumble. <laughs> Sometimes those uh, kind of issues between brothers can end friendships, they can divide families, and they can even fracture churches. Do you think holding on to hurt between two brothers doesn't impact your ministry for God and impact your ability to do other jobs God has for us? Pray for God's leading in your life if there are unresolved issues between you and your brother. And please don't wait any longer. All four groups that I mentioned in this passage cried out to the Lord. In their trouble, he delivered them from their distress. Let me tell you exactly, or specifically, what he did. And, and this week, if you get a chance, if you're in a struggle, I would ask you to go and find where your struggle, if it lines up with one of these other groups. A victim, or perhaps someone suffering from their own mistakes. It talks about a, uh, a group of businessmen with the, the intent to go out on the sea in ships. And uh, next thing you know, the waves are getting mighty high. And uh, things are starting to roll, and it says they lose their confidence and their strength, right? I, I can envision a, a businessman with, with the very best of intents. Scripture here says these guys had evil intent. But, but you know, you get into the, the ups and downs of the economy. You get into the ups and downs of, of uh, these cycles that go on out there. It can get pretty scary. At all times, we're to keep our eye focused on God and trust him to bring us to another place. Specifically, the uh, Scripture says that he, God, led them by a straight way. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. He made the storm be still and the waves of the sea were hushed. He brought them to their desired haven and he raises the needy out of affliction and makes their family like flocks. After each group is redeemed, the psalmist says, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to the children of man. As we read this and consider this, and again, I'd, I'd offer you to do that during the week. 
I wonder if we think about how many times God answers our specific prayer and how many times we ask for our child to make it home safely or to make it through a circumstance safely and, and they get home and we just kind of take it for granted. We don't realize yet another blessing has been placed upon us. I wonder if we don't do a good enough job celebrating God's answered prayers. You know, if, if uh, part of the reason I, I think that we, we lose sight that God's promises are going to be fulfilled is we don't even really know what else everybody's going through, right? If you're in elementary school and uh, somebody breaks their arm, everybody knows they're going to get a cast. Maybe, get, maybe they get to pick the color and everybody gets to sign it, right? And they, they know through experience that after time that cast will come off and the arm will probably work again, right? We don't really know what's going on emotionally in people's lives. And we don't see people in the different stages of those struggles. And we don't necessarily know when God, God has gotten to the other side because we're very private people. And, and again, I'm not saying we need to air our, all of our dirty laundry to everybody. But there is a tremendous amount of suffering going on. And there's a tremendous amount of blessing and working through that suffering and God bringing people through that as well. I would invite you to study uh, Psalm 107 and let the Lord speak to your life specifically. I would ask you that if, if you are finding even the concept going, you know, Edward, I, I don't think you get it. This is just too much. Uh, I'm sure I don't. I'm sure you're right. I'm sure it's much, uh, some people are dealing with some things much deeper than anything I can uh, say in a short 30-minute sermon. But it doesn't change the fact that we're to take that to God Almighty, that we are to look for him to grow us and to trust us more and for him to, to trust that he has not just placed us here to suffer for no reason, but there may be purpose in it. I pray that we would consider that perhaps today in a new way. At the end of the service, there will be people up front that would love uh, to pray with you, be it about items of salvation or struggles that you're dealing with or anything that's on your heart. And I pray that you would consider that this morning. If you would, please, I'd like to bow our heads and close. After, after we pray, Pastor Steve will come up and uh, make some announcements. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the uh, access we have to so much information where we, are see, we can see time and again. You taking people where they are and letting them uh, come to you with the right heart and bringing them to a new place. I pray for those in this room today whose hearts are troubled, who feel that they are facing a uh, insurmountable challenge. Dear God, uh, deep in their hearts, I, I, I bet they know they cannot do it alone, dear God. And I just pray that first and foremost, they would feel your presence in a new way, that they would look to see your fingerprints on their lives, that they would look for the doors that you want them to go through, and that they would be mindful of the people you place in their lives that point to you. And dear God, if it be your will, I, I pray that we would celebrate together the healing that takes place mentally, physically, and spiritually, and that we would come together as a body, and that we would continue to grow together and serve you together. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.